Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the BCPA April meeting. I am going to introduce introduce Kathy Davis, our president, to give you a few updates. All right, Kathy, you should be good to speak. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us on our virtual meeting for April. I'm looking forward to learning about crisis and continuity leadership in the time of coronavirus. I do have two announcements. Number one, the BCPA is a member of the Upper Midwest Security Alliance, and they put on the conference Secure 360, and they are open for business or whatever this year. Um, in May, they're going to have a virtual conference, but registering for this year also gets you into next year. So if you'd like a really good deal and a lot of CEUs, uh, you can attend a virtual conference this year and the in-person conference next year. So highly recommend going to secure360.org and looking at your options there. Also, I'd like to remind everybody that our May meeting is going to be with Dr. Mike Osterholm and he is, this meeting is also going to be virtual. So you can just plan ahead the second Thursday in May is going to be a virtual meeting and uh, Dr. Mike Osterholm will talk to us more about the coronavirus and uh, what he sees uh, coming ahead. So with that, let me pass it back over to our past uh, social media director, Marie, to introduce our speaker. Excellent, thank you, Kathy. All right, um, so I'd like to introduce Brian Strauser. He is a principal and chief executive at and founder at BrightPath LLC, and he's going to chat with us today about crisis and continuity leadership. Feel free to ask questions. Um, you should see a question panel, um, and we'll answer those as they kind of as they come in, probably more towards the end. Um, so take it away, Brian. And you can save all of your difficult uh, scientific questions for Dr. Osterholm next month. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Uh, I'm uh, Brian Strauser, and I, the uh, whoops, here we go. Um, the company I work with, BrightPath, uh, we are a crisis management to business continuity consulting firm based in Shoreview, Minnesota. Marie is actually in the office next to me. I, I can hear her like half a second before she comes across the webinar, so it's kind of weird. Um, but uh, you know, a couple things you should know about me beyond BrightPath. Uh, I'm currently a senior fellow at Auburn University Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. My work there has really been around public-private sector collaboration on national scale uh, disasters, homeland security issues, cybersecurity issues. So the current coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic is a great time to be affiliated with a group where we can talk and, and kind of think through these things uh, on a broader scale. I'm also a postgraduate student at King's College in the War Studies Department where I'm studying intelligence and how we use intelligence in the private sector. Here's what we're going to talk about kind of really um, three areas of presentation, and then we're gonna just open this up for Q&A because I think that'll be a lot more interesting to everyone. A, a, a briefing on the current situation, I'm gonna keep this fairly high level, but talk about some of the data as of um, about uh, 40 minutes ago where things stood uh, globally and, and here in the US and Minnesota. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, really lessons learned that we've seen across the fight against the coronavirus. I'm gonna share with you from our point of view, what we've seen at a number of private sector companies that have been successful, some things that we should all be thinking about just strategically around um, continuity and crisis issues related to coronavirus. And then I wanna talk about crisis leadership in particular and some things that we've seen leaders doing that have been really successful and some traps or pitfalls to avoid. And then lastly, what are some things we should think about um, over the coming weeks, you know, we're, a, a lot of folks think we're approaching peak, um, at least here in the U.S., but certainly Minnesota has been a pushed back a little bit in terms of when we think peak will come. But um, what does that next few weeks, what does the next few weeks start to look like? What are some things as business leaders we should be thinking about as we get to the other end of that? Then we'll open it up for, for Q&A and discussion. And as uh, Marie said, as we see questions come in along the way, um, we'll try to answer those if it's relevant to the slides we're talking about. So um, the data I'm about to show you for the situational briefing is from 12.50 p.m. 
today, so about 40 minutes ago. Um, and certainly these numbers have already changed. But globally, I'm showing you the uh, John Hopkins University uh, coronavirus dashboard. Globally, there's a little under uh, 1.45 million confirmed cases. These are tested confirmed cases uh, across the organization or across the world. Sorry about that. When the phone rings, all the phones ring at once. Um, it's got about 1.45 million cases. <clears throat> There's about 90, a little over 90,000 deaths globally, and about 344,000 folks have re have recovered uh, from uh, the coronavirus disease. So they've recovered. They're out of the hospital. They're back home and no longer quarantined. <clears throat> and in the lower right, you can see the uh, continually growing uh, graph of coronavirus confirmed cases around the world. Here in the United States, and here we're using CDC data and data from the University of Washington, there's uh, 427, a little over 427,000 cases as of noon today, um, about um, a little under 15,000 deaths. Um, you can find coronavirus cases now in 55 US, US jurisdictions, so all 50 states, four of the seven US territories and the District of Columbia. There is a little over 90,000 folks hospitalized in the United States. A little over 18,000 of those are in intensive care units. And there's about 15,653 ventilators currently being used. Uh, most of that hospital data is coming from the University of Washington's data collection from the states. If you look at the breakdown across states, uh, New York continues to have the most cases at just under 160,000 and they crossed the threshold of 7,000 fatalities today. New Jersey is at 51,000 with 1,700 deaths. And then you can see Michigan, California, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, all pretty close together in terms of numbers. Massachusetts, which used to be towards the top in terms of number of cases has been really superseded by several other states. And then Florida and Illinois kind of bringing up the end of this particular list. Here in Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Health announced at their noon update today, uh, 1,242 cases cumulative, that's 50 new cases since yesterday, were up to 50 deaths from coronavirus. So this kind of sets the stage just in terms of data um, of what we're seeing across the, the country and around the world. There's some challenges with the data. Um, the biggest one is, um, widespread testing, particularly in the United States, has not been available. So this has made the, some of the statistics a little questionable in terms of the number of confirmed cases, um, and it's made in containment very difficult. Um, as Osterholm will tell you next month, in traditional epidemiology, you would find a confirmed case, you would interview them and people they interacted with to determine who is exposed, you would then test those individuals, and you would and you would then continue to quarantine and contain um, folks that were infected until you had stamped out the pandemic. Um, that's proven impossible to do, at least here in the United States, because we didn't we don't have enough testing available. Um, we're really only testing folks who are going into the hospital, who are going to be hospitalized, um, or um, you know are are displaying really severe symptoms. Those are the folks that are being tested. Uh, at least here in Minnesota, it's been a little more, testing's been a little more available in New York and some of the other locations where there's more cases. So the lack of testing has really made um, containment hard and statistics questionable. Um, different websites are using data differently. Um, the John Hopkins dashboard is a good example of this. They're pulling in data from the World Health Organization, the CDC, a host of other locations, and then media reports. So in some cases, they'll openly acknowledge that they're double counting some cases, so their numbers may be higher. We tend to stick to the CDC and state health department um, statistics. Because of all of that, community spread is likely pervasive. And you've, if you've been watching any of the press conferences here by the Minnesota Department of Health, um, they'll tell you that community spread is probably pervasive, meaning that there's probably somewhere between six and 10 to 12 times the number of cases that we know about because we don't have the testing to be able to determine really what does that containment look like? Um, the other important thing to know, to, to remember, is that um, this data is a lagging indicator of cases. 
coronavirus is um, people who are carrying the virus are not symptomatic for between um, six and 14 days. So they don't know that they're sick. They don't know they're carrying the virus. They don't know they're going to be sick. You see those cases then show up 14 days or longer down the road. So it's really, it's always a lagging indicator of the number of cases that are really out in the environment. So with using all this to set the stage, there's a number of significant challenges that we're really faced with here. Um, our ability to contain the pandemic has really failed. We're in a, because of the, the testing issues and others that we've laid out here previously, we're really into a mitigation strategy at this point, even here in Minnesota, where um, if you watched Governor Walz's press conference yesterday, it's quite clear that actions that have been taken in Minnesota have minimized the number of cases. We have the lowest number of cases per capita in the country right now, but we're still just mitigating what has happened because we've shown that we're not able to contain the pandemic. Um, we know the healthcare system doesn't have the capacity to handle um, a pandemic of this scale, um, particularly where we're seeing uh, lots of cases in, in New York and elsewhere. <clears throat> we're of course experienced significant economic impact, not just as individuals, but our companies. And I'm sure everyone's company uh, here on this uh, webinar has been impacted in some way. And we don't really know when this is going to end. So there's a lot of uncertainty that's there. For most of our lifetimes, this is probably the first landscape scale crisis that we've faced uh, as a society, as business continuity and crisis management leaders. Um, Dutch Leonard and uh, Arnold Howitt really defined this idea of a landscape scale crisis in a paper in 2009. And I think this describes the situation well. We're in an unexpected event or sequence of events of enormous scale and overwhelming speed that results in a high degree of uncertainty. And this gives rise to disorientation, a feeling of lost control and strong emotional disturbance. So this kind of sets the scale for stage for where we're at. Now, obviously there's been a lot of actions taken by government um, and I, I'm not gonna go into all the detail, but we have lots of stay at home, uh, shelter in place orders. Uh, 41 states have those and the handful of states that don't are considering similar actions. But I did think this graph for Minnesota really told an interesting tale this is the drop in traffic on Minnesota's highways that are maintained by MnDOT, by the State Department of Transportation. And, you know, coronavirus was impacting us all throughout the month of March. A lot of companies went through the beginnings of stay of, uh, of work from home, stay at home kind of approach. Um, we have a big drop here in mid-March when the governor recommended that folks stay home. And then on March 23rd, he issued the stay at home order, which took effect on March 25th. And you see the huge drop in traffic on Minnesota's highways. I couldn't find a, a more recent version of this uh, graph, which is from uh, I think the 29th or 30th of, uh, of last month. Um, but I think it would show, you know, kind of a flat lining of traffic, maybe a little uptick now that those, the, the executive order has changed a bit. So let's shift now that we've kind of laid the groundwork for what's going on. Let's talk about some lessons learned and, and kind of segue from there into some crisis leadership. And I think, you know, many of our organizations, including ones that I used to work for here in the Twin Cities, undoubtedly had some type of pandemic plan, um, probably had some kind of crisis management framework or crisis management plan that was in place. But when you're confronted with a novel situation, there's no off the shelf comprehensive execu executable plan that you're gonna pull out and use because you're really in a situation that is, is completely unprecedented from things that we've been in before. I think this comes becomes really clear when we start thinking about how most of us will plan for a crisis. And this is really represented on the left of this graphic. We think about all of the things that we expect to be faced with as continuity and crisis management and business leaders. Um, that might be a hurricane, a tornado, flooding being common here in the Midwest, um, a violent attack, a workplace violence situation, an after shooter, uh, the need to, uh, you know, a severe weather that causes us to evacuate. But for these routine incidents, even if they're kind of rare, we build plans that are specific to those situations. And when something happens, we pull out that plan 
and we start acting upon that plan, we know what to do. We've got a checklist. We've got this thing we're going to work through. We know the questions to ask. We've got this menu of actions we're going to take. But when we get over to the right-hand side and we're confronted with something or a combination of some things, even a combination of things that we know how to deal with, well, now we don't have a plan anymore because we're faced with that novel situation. And for a lot of us, and I would argue even you know state by state and nationally to some extent, no one really predicted with any seriousness a pandemic like this that went to this extent that caused us to take the public health actions that we have. And our companies have had to react to this as well. So we're in this really novel situation where having the ability to make decisions collaboratively and communicate the results of those decisions have really become more important than having a specific plan for this situation. So companies that we've seen manage this well right now um, have some kind of crisis management process. And the success factors that we've seen are really three things. Um, we're, we've seen crisis management processes that are really being coordinated by the top operational management of the organization, the, the senior executives, and they're involving the subject matter experts, business continuity, uh, crisis management, global security, or corporate security, or what you may call what you might call that, the right operational leaders, the right health experts, if you have those in your organization. Um, we've seen uh, companies succeed where they've had processes that give experts and leaders the autonomy that they need to come up with and implement creative and pragmatic solutions. And we've seen a lot of different ways of doing this, a lot of different structures. But the ones that are managing well have a process that fits really within the culture of how they collaborate and make decisions. And it has direct regular involvement by senior executives. That doesn't necessarily mean that the senior executives are sitting on the crisis management team and really getting into the weeds, but that there's involvement and buy-in and a chance for them to weigh in on some of the major decisions that are being made. When we think about goals here for crisis management, as you're working through the current crisis, um, having processes that help you understand what is going on um, and then briefing that understanding where the company stands, what's happening around us locally, nationally, globally, if that's applicable, um, and publishing that from a single source of truth. You can call it a nerve center, a media monitoring center, a commander operations center. Um, you might have a daily email. Maybe there's an internal portal or SharePoint site or something that folks are going to. But there's a single source of truth that is briefing out to the organization where things stand <clears throat> and what's happening around you, the context that leaders need to make decisions, the metrics they need to help make decisions. We're look, we've seen companies uh, establish consistent battle rhythms of meetings and communication. And here I mean that you've the company has put some thought into Here's how we're going to gather our crisis team or our executive team or our communications team. Here's the kind of communications we're going to track and publish. And here's how we're going to be consistent with that, but also make adjustments to it as necessary. Um, one of our larger clients is a healthcare technology company. They were doing daily uh, and they operate globally. So that has complicated things for them, but they've had daily crisis management calls with a subset of the executive team. And now that we've kind of landed over the last week or so into kind of the current normal where we know we're going to be kind of working from home nationally until May, uh, we know what uh, other countries that they're working in, India, uh, the Philippines and elsewhere, we know what they're doing, kind of know the direction of the, uh, at a country level, things start to feel a little stable. So they just backed off of seven days a week to three. And now they've got a new battle rhythm that's been communicated. Here's how we're going to meet. Here's how we're going to escalate. Here's how we're going to communicate. So you want to do something kind of similar to that approach. Take the right cadence that's going to work for your company. You want to make sure you've got your crisis management framework and process to decide upon what you need to do next and then execute and monitor those actions. You want to make sure those actions fit with the values of your organization, but also the new societal norms that are out there. We're in a work from home situation and 41 states are in this shelter in place, stay at home mode. So 
you know, getting together for meetings isn't a norm right now. So how do you, you know, what's the, what's the virtual version of that that's your current societal norm? There's four areas of focus uh, that we've been articulating over the last couple of weeks that we're seeing companies focus on um, and that we think are still relevant today. The first is just protecting your workforce, taking actions to ensure your team is safe. And this can be everything from the safety in your workplace. Maybe you're in manufacturing or food where you're still running your factories, you're still running production lines. So what's that safety approach to make sure that folks coming in are not sick, that they're not spreading disease, that you've got the right response mechanisms in place, but also all the steps companies have been taking around pay, benefits, incentive pay, sick leave, attendance policies, medical care, and et cetera. But making sure, also making sure that you're engaging with your customers, that they understand how this has impacted your ability to deliver upon your services. And I think share that as transparently as you can with them. I think your customers are looking for that kind of radical transparency right now, not just to understand if you're capable, if you're, if you're still going to be an ongoing enterprise, right? You're still going to be capable of delivering upon the things that they've contracted with you to do, or that if you're a retailer, you're still going to be there for them to go buy their favorite products uh, from you, whether that's food or, or you know toilet paper or something else, but also what adjustments you're making to your strategy so that you'll continue to be a viable organization. And then two kind of forward-looking areas of focus. Um, the first is to look at your supply chain from a continuity perspective and ensure that it's stabilized. And here I mean um, whether your supply chain is critical parts or it's raw material for manufacturing or it's third-party services or business process outsourcers that your company depends upon to operate, what's their continuity capability? And where possible, are there places where that can be reinforced before things um, get worse in some parts of the country that are still not as affected by COVID-19 as perhaps the United States is? So for example, if you're reliant upon India, India is towards the early stages of coronavirus right now, but that's going to get considerably worse considerably fast. So what it, you know, what can you do to make sure that your suppliers are prepared for that disruption. Do you have geographical options for distribution or is there something else, other tactics that you can take? And then lastly, stress test your financials. Really look at your company's financial operating model, your free cash flow, and I would um, work with your finance team to simulate applying stress against that model to understand how it impacts your business operations. For example, what if your key supplier, what if one of your key suppliers drops out because they can't continue to deliver uh, services or parts or raw materials for you? And your replacement cost, the replacement vendor is 10 to 12 to 15 percent higher, which given this market is entirely possible. What does that do to your business? How does that impact your financials? What if you have a 10 or 15 percent or more downturn in business? How does that impact your long term financials and cash flow? Um, so this is an important exercise that um, if you haven't done, if your company hasn't done, it's definitely something to take a look at in the near term. A couple other things to highlight that I, I, I think are relevant based on what we've been seeing around uh, the U.S. and globally. The first is to make sure you have a good plan for a confirmed positive case in your workplace. Um, this is more, at this point, since most of us have been working from home for a few weeks, this is probably most relevant to those of you that have companies that you've got some kind of production or manufacturing or essential business where folks have to be in the office or in a, on a manufacturing or production floor to do the work. Um, but in those environments, you'll want to make sure you have a plan for how you're going to deal with a confirmed case in that workspace. What steps will you take to take care of that employee? Like what's your leave policy? How will they communicate it to you? Uh, what kind of benefits and such are available to them? But then start thinking through, how do you clean that workplace that they're in? How do you tell the team? How do you protect the team that's there? Do you need to do any contact tracing to determine who they've had interaction with that may also want to go get evaluated? Are you required to report to the local public health agencies? Or will they come and tell you? Uh, and this is, this is different county by county in some states right now. 
Um, so these are all things you want to, to consider. Um, I also would encourage you to think about how do you ha- how do you want to handle a false report. Um, some of our clients that work in food production um, have had a number of they've had more false reports than they've had actual coronavirus cases, and that's led to you know disciplinary action and you know some other challenges to take. But also they've had employees who have just gone on social media and said, "Hey, I work at XYZ in New Jersey, and I." Um, I've got four or five coworkers who are positive for COVID-19. My company doesn't care and they're not doing anything. They're making us work with sick people. Entirely false, but a reputation issue for that organization. So how do you want to handle those cases if they come up? Communication with your team right now is critical. Um, there, um, There's a survey that came out um, in early March from Edelman about uh, um, coronavirus communication, and I was fascinated by one of the questions, which is, who do you trust uh, to communicate with you about COVID-19? The government, local, state, county, federal, your employer, or your friends? And there might be some others mixed in there. But the survey showed that workers trusted communication from their company, from their employer, more than they trusted communication from government at any single level. So your employees are looking for communication, not just what the company is doing, but to some extent, recommendations like, you know, passing along the CDC's uh, guidelines on, you know, personal protection about, you know, if you feel sick, stay home, don't go to work. Uh, If you, you should avoid social gatherings in groups of more than 10 and et cetera, et cetera. Wash your hands for 20 seconds or more. So companies, your employees are really, your employees are really looking for that kind of communication. I'd also encourage you to establish internal and external hubs of information um, for your employees and for your customers and other external stakeholders. Use those to centralize the information that's there. Make sure you're providing your employees with credible external sources of information, the CDC, you know, state or county or city public health agencies, et cetera. Um, Also think through how all the different ways your employees get information. Uh, Sending an hourly employee that works on a production line to look at the internet may not be the right step. There's probably a bulletin board or digital screens or speaking points that can be given to their leaders to communicate in a huddle or what have you, but just make sure you're covering all of those possibilities that are out there. Two examples of just good external communication hubs. Uh, one is Athena Health, which is a healthcare company out in Boston. Um, this is from a week or so ago, but this is their external facing uh, COVID-19 hub. They've got a video from their CEO related to their Healthcare Heroes campaign. Um, this company makes electronic medical record software. Whoops. Um, on the right column here, they've got their kind of um, press releases and other um uh, statements about the actions they're taking internally, and then because they are a healthcare, um, you know, data analytics company, they have, um, you know, good interactives on high-risk patients and lab testing and some of that kind of thing. And then also, I think Target's done a nice job, um, as well as several other companies here in the Twin Cities. Um, this is Target's current uh, external hub. I think this is from late March, but um, good video and written communication from Brian Cornell, Target's CEO. Um, and you know, good communication in terms of press releases and how they're handling things for employees and others, employees and guests, customers. Let's shift a bit and talk just about crisis leadership before we get to kind of the future projections and Q&A. This is a crisis unlike any other that we've seen in recent times. And there's really, there's a number of challenges that I think businesses, um, leaders rather, are faced with. There's really not a plan or playbook that we can pull out for this one. As one leader, one business leader told me last week when we were kind of surveying information for this presentation, um, their first move from a continuity standpoint started with their worst case scenario they had ever considered. And things got considerably worse from that over the following five to seven days. So there's really not a plan or playbook that uh, we can pull out in this situation as crisis and continuity leaders. We've got a a significant amount of uncertainty and and unpredictability on what's gonna happen next for all of us. We've got a workforce that is fearful, not just of the virus and the possibility of getting sick, but also 
what does this mean for their employment, short, medium, long term, and the economic stability of our economy? Of course, there's a shaky economic foundation. And then we have a customer um, and consumer marketplace, B2B and B2C marketplace, that's really bordered on, a little bit bordered on panic. I mean, when you see there's no toilet paper available at your local Target or Walmart or Aldi, and there hasn't been for a few weeks, you're definitely looking at a consumer marketplace that's built a bit on panic. Some lessons for leaders that we've seen throughout um, the coronavirus crisis over the last month. Um, one of the biggest lessons that we've seen is that companies and leaders who can who have moved early on major decisions have had a distinct advantage in the crisis. Um, we heard a couple examples from large organizations as we were interviewing them last week about making early decisions about purchasing laptops, web cameras, collaboration, software licensing, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, particularly uh, in other countries that enable them to move to work from home, as an example, early, and in doing so, um, really were able to take advantage of that. Whereas if they had waited, they wouldn't have been able to get laptops or Wi-Fi hotspots or other equipment because they would have been in a queue, a back order queue that was thousands upon thousands of items long. If you try to buy a webcam, unless something's changed in the last 24 hours, if you try to buy a Logitech webcam from Best Buy or Amazon right now, uh, you're not gonna find one within 250 miles of the Twin Cities. And Amazon, I, I don't know what the back order was, I think it was mid-May before you could get your hands on one. Teams, of, teams and their leaders have had to make really unprecedented decisions so far. Um, as I said earlier, really far beyond what their worst case disruption scenarios were. Um, many of our clients, as we were talked with them last week about this presentation, one of the things they brought up is if you think about your traditional business continuity planning for your vendors that are providing business process outsourcing services, they're operating in one or two Asia countries. And one of your most common continuity plans is, well, they'll just shift production to one of their facilities in another country. Because we're thinking about earthquakes, tsunamis, wildfires, power disruption. You can't do geographical relocation when the, when the entire world is impacted by the virus. So that option is off the table suddenly. But that was the main continuity strategy for many of them in, a, in terms of a country to country level move. So there's just really a lot of unprecedented decisions that I'm sure all of you have had to make. We also heard from teams that had recently exercised, and by recently, I mean within the last year, that they had recently gone through some type of um, tabletop or simulation exercise of their business continuity or crisis management plans. And they highlighted those exercises as being beneficial to them in terms of having muscle memory on how to get together, how to collaborate, how to make decisions during the crisis. It also kept them familiar with the content of their business continuity plan, which we know not all leaders will <clears throat> always remember what's in there. Leaders talked a lot about just being straightforward and honest with their teams about the situation. They saw success in planning and scheduling virtual social time. Um, teams were having virtual happy hours. Um, they were doing uh, lunch meetings together where they were just getting together and eating their meals at home through Zoom or Microsoft Teams or WebEx and having that social connectivity. Um, we also heard from one uh, team, a couple teams uh, at some larger companies in the Fortune 50 that did all day working sessions early in the crisis where they would get on their collaboration tool with their webcams and they really just started knocking through the challenges in front of them that they needed to address. And it for them, it felt like um, they had really knocked down some silos within the organization, uh, within their division, and were really working through this as a team, despite being spread out to their individual homes and such. One of the organizations that researches crisis management leadership um, that I think is worth looking at is the uh, National Preparedness Leadership Initiative, or NPLI program, at Harvard University's uh, JFK School of Government. And they talk about crisis leaders. They do research into how leaders uh, manage through these difficult large-scale 
um, crisis situations like coronavirus, they think about um, their research has led them to five dimensions of crisis leadership or meta leadership as they call it because it manifests itself differently in different people but that the strongest leaders exhibit some combination of these five characteristics um, the person themselves usually successful crisis managers have strong self-awareness of their strengths and their weaknesses as leaders and they exercise a high degree of emotional intelligence so they're pretty stable consistent throughout the crisis. Um, they see the big picture of the situation, have a good understanding of what they don't know as they lead a crisis team or a business team through the crisis. And they're focused on the main event, the main event being what are the most important goals I need to achieve by leading through this crisis. And then three directions in which leaders lead in a crisis. They have to lead their silo, that's their organization. And this is about servant leadership. It's about serving and taking care of your team. But they're also required to lead up. They have to lead up to their boss, um, or, or it might be in, in some cases, they're leading up to an elected official. Uh, in that case, I'm still their boss, but just a different way of thinking about that. But that they're required to speak truthfully and not be afraid to challenge upwardly in order to ensure that the, the leader is hearing the right information to make the decisions that need to be made. And the best crisis leaders are leading across their organization. They're forging bridges and making connections. They're linking their organization to others and they're removing barriers. They're knocking those silos down and, and driving a horizontal connectivity within the organization. Um, Vice Admiral Peter Neffinger, one of the faculty members at, at the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative, um, has some similar points uh, that he's made and actually spoke with, he spoke with the Minnesota legislature yesterday and talked a little bit about his experience in leading large-scale crises. And there's a couple of interesting bits of wisdom here that I think are worth passing along. One is that there will be an end to this. It feels a little indeterminable right now, particularly to Marie and I's children, but there, there is an end. There's going to be an end to this crisis at some point. We just don't know when it is right now. The crisis that you're in is never just one thing. Um, if you think about all the different factors we're having to address as crisis and continuity leaders right now within our organization and, and what we're having to deal with as a society and as a country, uh, there's a lot of factors here. And it's not just coronavirus, but it's the cascading impacts of that. The crisis gives convening authority. And this is an important one for us because this is the part that makes us important right now. We have the convening authority. We have this opportunity to make business continuity and crisis management more important than it ever was within your organization. But only if you're willing to make yourself important, if you're willing to take on that mantle of leadership. The crisis reveals, a crisis reveals identity and culture. Think about what the crisis has revealed about your company and about other companies in your industry. Not all of them are necessarily doing well. It tells us a little bit about who our companies really are and what our culture really is. Crises also expose systematic problems in an organization. Things that we can solve as crisis and continuity leaders as we work through this but some of those problems are going to be very apparent. And then lastly, even though we're the crisis and continuity leaders, the crisis isn't about us. It's about our team and it's about each other and how we can help them be better and be safe and healthy through this. One humorous thing I, I heard from uh, them yesterday in their conversation, which is uh, you need to define an appropriate role for politicians or they will start finding something to do that you don't want. Obviously, that's directed at uh, you know uh, state emergency managers and county emergency managers, but I think quite funny given some of the political conversation that's gone on around coronavirus. Uh, if you're looking for a book to read and you liked some of that insight from the Harvard crew, uh, last year they released a book called You're It, Crisis, Change, and How to Lead When It Matters Most. You can find that on Amazon. It's a fantastic read. Uh, and really gets pretty far into crisis leadership. There are several Twin Cities companies in the book, by the way, uh, Target, um, 
I believe TCF Bank is mentioned and the University of Minnesota um, all have some examples uh, that are Owen Medtronic uh, are all inside in the book. So as we said, as leaders, there's no plan for this crisis, but we do know how to collaborate. We do know how to communicate. We do know how to set priorities. We know how to develop solutions and then execute upon those solutions. And we know how to lead. And even if, since even though there's not a plan for this crisis, we have all the skills that we need to get through this. So I'll pull out my crystal ball, I'll tell you a little bit about the next couple of weeks, and then let's get into uh, Q&A. There's a lot of hard decisions ahead of us, uh, ahead of us as crisis and business leaders, continuity leaders. Uh, and these are just a few, but we've been working remotely, and this has probably led us to a new rule set of how to collaborate, how to work at a distance, maybe some new team structures. There may have been some new leaders that have arisen. We may have seen some leaders not be able to adapt quite as well or some employees not be able to adapt quite as well. How will that change uh, in the new normal when we go back to the office? Uh, and will we go back to the office or will that be something different? Um, we've had companies that didn't have collaboration tools, virtual collaboration tools that have had to invest in this. Um, and there are some companies that despite all of that didn't invest in anything and they're just using conference bridges and such. How does that change how we think about this in the future or a year or two down the road? One of the challenges that have arisen through this is that we're always on because we're working from home. So what are the boundaries that we are setting? What are the boundaries we're going to set in the future? Smartphones were part of, of what led us down this always on approach. Um, but what does this look like now that we have been working from home all the time and we have WebEx and Zoom and Microsoft Teams and other tools? What kind of productivity rules are we going to see in the future? How does this change our scenario planning and decisions we need to make? For your uh, chief financial officers and those of you that think about liquidity as a potential crisis or continuity challenge for your company, how does liquidity and cash flow factor into the next several months? Uh, and then coming out of this, what's our, are there new operating and working models that we might want to adapt from this time where we've had to be more flexible? Are there some lessons we can capture about being more agile than what we were if we had to do this sitting around a conference table? And if our clients and customers have gotten more used to this kind of transparency, well, what does that transparency look like when it's back to normal or what that new normal might look like? It's also what I think is going to be one of the bigger challenges, and I think this is a challenge now, and we're not always talking about it, but I expect we will see significant mental health challenges across the board as this crisis continues. This was the number one opportunity that came up as we interviewed companies last week uh, leading up to this presentation um, and a similar presentation we did for UMSA last week, um, which is how do we make sure our employees have access to mental health care? What tips and tricks can we give them for helping manage through this situation? And what happens if this continues for another month or two months or three months? How do we make sure that they're getting the help that they need? And I, I think it's also fair to say that as, as leaders, um, most of us probably have strong emotional intelligence that what makes us good at being crisis management and business continuity leaders. But I think over the last month, if we're all being honest with each other, We've probably had a moment or two where we sat down on the couch and went, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I don't, I don't know if I can handle this. And I, that's okay. That's, that's part of kind of growing through this and, and having friends and colleagues that you can connect with. But that's the, some of the mental health challenges that I think we're going to be faced with in the weeks and months to come. How do we know when it's time to go back to the office? Well, there's kind of three factors that uh, I think will be in place before that happens, before these stay-at-home orders start to be lifted. One is a decline in cases or a near-flat uh, growth in new cases. Um, we'll see the public health response shift to a more relaxed posture. And then lastly, we'll see some availability, most likely first of antibody testing, which is actually being um, evaluated and tested uh, on a smaller scale right now, including something from Mayo. Um, but also in the long term, we'll, we should have an effective vaccine in the 18-month in the timeframe. Now, certainly, I think we'll be back in the office before the vaccine comes out, 
But that availability of testing regimes, wide availability of testing, I think is going to be necessary before we really find ourselves back to whatever the new normal will be. And what will that new normal look like? I think some of those questions that I posed earlier, questions that leaders are going to need to make, um, will be a part of that. But I, I don't think we quite know what that's, what the new normal is going to look like quite yet. I would encourage you, however, in your companies, if you haven't already done so, think about the planning that you need to do. I would start thinking formally about a, a, a planning cell or planning group, whatever term you want to use, about returning to the office. Uh, and what that, I think there's time to start, it is time to start thinking about what that will look like. And I think it's fair to, to think about this almost as a matrix of um, there might be some different approaches that happen. I doubt, what I don't think is going to happen is that everything's going to get lifted and we're all suddenly just going to go back to the office and start working. I think it's going to be more of a transition. We're going to start thinking about, uh, th I would think about it in terms of turning things on the same way that things were turned off in the past as we, as we escalated into where we are today. I'd start to think about how do we de-escalate in stages to return back to the office. I think it's fair to think about what possible restrictions might be in place from governments that we're gonna have to comply with and realize those may be different by state. Um, like for example, when New York started turning off um, folks being able to go to work, it was, you can only have half of your workforce in the office and then it was 25% and then it was stay home. I think it's fair to say that they'll probably reverse that to bring people back. You may have to social distance within the work environment. So you think about a cubicle, you know, a call center where folks are working in relatively small cubicles that might not be far enough. The seats may not be far enough to be effectively social distanced. So if that's a requirement, what does that look like if you have to do that? Maybe only people who have negative tests can go back to work. Maybe folks who only have only folks who have negative tests can get on a commercial airline flight. Well, you have to wear masks in the workplace. These are all things that I don't know what they're going to be, and I don't think anybody knows what these might be, but this is the kind of planning that I think would benefit your organization to start on now so that when we start to have these restrictions lifted, we're ready to go with whatever the options might be to go back to work, go back to the office, I should say. Your, again, as we said before, your collaboration and operating models uh, might have changed, uh, or it's also, I think, it just behooves you to think about as leaders, uh, how do we want those to change when we go back to the office? Are they going to be different? What do you want to adapt from the work from home era of coronavirus to the new normal within your organization? And I think this is deserving of, of good uh, long-term thought rather than having to do this on a scramble. And then don't forget, um, capture lessons learned and use those to your advantage. I would encourage you, you we're, we're really a month into this thing right now, uh, full scale. Um, it's a good time to go around and capture some lessons learned. Ask your business continuity plan owners and their leaders and your executives, like, hey, in the last month, uh, what do you wish you knew at the start that you know now? What strategies do you think have been effective? What have you learned? Uh, what are you worried about in the coming month? What are the obstacles or blockers that are in your way? And I think it's worth talking about that as a leadership team now so that you can build upon the things that you've learned. Um, but in the end, I think all of these lessons learned can be used to your advantage as a crisis and continuity leader, not just to show that you're connected to your company strategies and that the things you're doing drives your company forward, but I think it's a great opportunity to gain resources coming out of this that helps grow your program and make your company more resilient. This is my favorite photo from all of the things that have gone on. Uh, this is the U.S. Navy ship Comfort entering, uh, uh, coming up to New York City, passing the Statue of Liberty on its way to dock. Uh, they've got, uh, I think it was 60 patients on board that I saw this morning. Uh, one of my friends uh, and colleagues uh, from days past is a U.S. Public Health Service officer, and she's serving on board in the medical complement uh, here. And um, this picture gives me hope that there, we will find our way out of this. We will, there will be another end to this. And as Admiral Neffinger says, this crisis too shall end. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. I think we've got 
about 10 or 15 minutes or so left here. Maria, I can't see any questions. Thank you. Screen, so. I know. I know. I will read them to you. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Um, go ahead and type your questions in the question box, or if you want to actually speak, I raise your hand. I will unmute you, and you can ask the question um, real time. Uh, the number one question I'm getting is, will the slides be available after the meeting? Oh, yes, I can make the slides available to you and you can distribute those. All right. No other questions? You guys are making it way too easy. <laughs> Oh, here's another question. Um, maybe. Where'd it go? Oh, Matt. Should companies, uh, Matt has asked, should companies plan on employees asking if they can have a remote job permanently? I think, yes, you should be prepared for that. I think that... Uh, one thing that I think has been shown through this uh, in almost every company that I've talked with, and, and you're seeing it in the, the business journals too, that, you know, I, I think a lot of folks used to say, well, I don't, I don't want people to work from home. Those jobs can't be done working from home. And yet now we're finding those jobs can indeed be done working from home. So I think there's a fair question here um, that smart companies I think would take advantage of. And that is, you know, should we allow these jobs to be um, to work from home on a permanent basis? Um, and I, I mean, I think the question to ask about this from a cost standpoint is, do I really need these large downtown offices that we've been building for decades uh, if this work can be done nearly as productive or as productive uh, in working from home? When I, when I worked for the University of Phoenix a few years ago as the chief security officer, um, the, they sold themselves to a private equity firm and I was fascinated by one of the things that they did, which was when they combined their headquarters buildings to reduce the real estate footprint. Instead of asking, can you do this job from home? Which is the way I think most people would approach, you know, trying to figure out office space like that. They asked the reverse, they reframed the question. And the question was, do you need to have an office or a cubicle in this complex to do the work that you do? Like, do you really have to be here to be effective in your job? And it totally flipped the narrative on its head and allowed a lot of folks to be comfortable saying, no, actually, I would be just as effective working from home. And so that's what they did. They, they pushed a lot of folks out to remote work because it saved them a ton of money from a real estate perspective. And as far as they can tell, they've seen no real impact or loss of productivity from that. So I think you are going to, I think we will hear from employees that um, asking if they can continue to work from home. Um, so kind of a follow-up question on that. Um, when you did, when you did some of the surveys or questions with the companies, did they indicate plans to make these work model changes going forward? Everyone that we talked to was on the early end of thinking about that. So there, there wasn't anyone that had come out and said, yes, we're going to do X, Y, Z that's different. Um, there is one, one organization we had talked with that had just started that process this, coming into this week. Um, but they were really thinking about, how, you know, for our folks that did work from home, and they had some uh, employees that had to come in for mail production, uh, you know, dealing with inbound payments and that kind of thing. But the thing that they were looking at is if we've done all of this work from home successfully, um, how, what's, you know, they're trying to capture what had changed, you know, what, what were effective practices that had gone on, what had changed in terms of how put people thought about collaborating. And they were trying to capture how, what, what was it like before, say, February 1st? And what's it been like since then? And what's been the positive part of that? And they're trying to capture that to figure out how does that change their operating model moving forward? Yeah. 
Yeah, and Curtis brings up a good point. You know, you're reducing some rental expenses on space, right? Um, it, and that could be cheaper than the telecommunication or some of the other expenses that are in place. Right. And there were definitely um, there were definitely opportunities from a production standpoint, or a pr productivity standpoint. And I think lots of us on the call are going to recognize these for what they are. But, um, you know, for some folks, um, especially for uh, IT folks that needed to be able to look at more than just what's on a laptop screen, um, they needed external monitors. They needed, you know, more than one monitor in order to be feel, be at what they thought was peak product productivity. Some folks were able to accomplish that with personally owned equipment. That's not ideal. Some folks were able to get monitors issued to them by their employer, um, and I think that's been helpful. But then we've got there were folks, uh, you know, particularly in other countries, that were just dealing with a single laptop screen where they were used to coming in to three or four monitors. So there's definitely some trade-offs in terms of equipment for information workers that there's there's it's worth some further research and analysis to figure out the right course there i like lots of screens. exactly yep so some other questions um kind of around the lessons learned questions do do you have some of those questions on hand that you could share with the group or were those uh just what you had heard from other people that was one of the questions um, when we did the interviews of other companies, we were really asking, um, I don't have these on a the slide, but I can repeat them here. Uh, we, we were asking a handful of questions, kind of big picture, and that led us to some follow-up questions. The questions were, um, one was, what, what do you wish you knew a month ago? What, what do you know now that you wish you had known at the start of this crisis? Kind of getting at what, what are the two or three things as a leader that you really wish you had understood on March 1st or so, but you know now. Um, another question was, what, what strategies have you found to be successful as you worked through the last month with your team? And so that got us a lot of the virtual happy hour and the working sessions and you know all day persistent chat in Teams or Slack or what have you. Um, one of the other questions we asked is, uh, you know, what are some obstacles or blockers that are in front of you for the next month? Um, also, like, what are you worried about right now? And that the, that what are you worried about question, um, very open-ended, obviously, but it, it got us to a lot of, I think, the personal angst of some of the leaders that was things that were on their minds. We got a lot of really interesting answers there, like, I, I don't know what I, I don't know how well prepared we are to deal with an employee who has died from coronavirus um so we i mean we got to really a, a lot of the i think the inner worries of some of the leaders um so those are that's the bulk of the questions that we asked okay um kind of in the same vein of these questions which i i think have been very eye-opening um <sighs> How do you get, how do you get time on their you know get time discuss best lessons learned questions when you're trying to get staff is busy or you don't have a lot of time how did you what was kind of your strategy around getting to just get 30 minutes on their calendar or how did you go about doing that um we well okay so i'm going to give you a, a split answer in terms of from our standpoint uh, we just approached clients uh, to ask these, primarily clients or people that were in our network uh, from my time at Target or, you know, that I'd gone to school with or what have you, uh, and just asked for 15 to 30 minutes to run through some questions about their company's coronavirus response and their response as leaders. Um, so that's how we approach that. But I think we also have done some efforts inside of companies for clients and the way we approach that to kind of capture midstream lessons learned, the way that we approach that is we had the business continuity uh, executive sponsor send an email to the people that we wanted to interview uh, in that particular company. Let's say it was about 14 or 15 folks. We And we wrote this email, but it was essentially, um, hey, we're a month in and you know, thank you for all your efforts and here's some successes we've had as an organization. Uh, our outside partner, BrightPath, is going to uh, set up uh, a 15 to 30 minute appointment with you to talk through uh, lessons learned from your perspective as a leader 
as the owner of a, of a critical continuity function um, to understand what has worked for your team, what concerns you may have moving forward, and capture some other information that will help us hone our response over the coming month. So something along the, it was wordier than that, but kind of similar to those lines. And then we just set up the time uh, to do uh -huh. that. We, we didn't get declined from anyone, but that was a pretty clear message from uh, one of their peers that they needed to set time aside for this. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely when it comes, using that executive sponsor is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Kind of shifting gears now, um, Roger's asking, what do you see as a potentially the biggest ch change or major change as a result of this crisis? Um, I think a lot of our, I, I think for a while, a year or so, uh, depending upon if there's further waves of this, I think that the, um, I think our kind of business and societal norms about gatherings, about getting together, about social interactions uh, are going to change pretty radically. I don't know. Um, I mean, how long will it be before those of us on the call are comfortable going to a Minnesota Twins baseball game and being in close proximity to 35, 40,000 people? Um, how long before we're going to be comfortable going to church uh, and sitting, you know, in a pew? Uh, with others. Uh, and I mean, for example, Marie and I are Catholic. Uh, you know, we shake hands uh, during mass and you're greeting people and you're, you're kind of sitting in close proximity to folks. Um, will we do that? Uh, you know, are, are, are we going to go to a church service? Will those norms for mass still be the same or will it be different? So I think those are, those are all uh, questions uh, that might be different yeah. moving forward. But everyone's going to come to Secure 360 and physically in 2021, so we know that. Um, <laughs> so the next question is um, from Lindsay. Do you have any strong recommendations for the return to office plan specifically for corporate offices? I use the staggered return schedule, create shifts within the office. Curious what you're hearing from for the long-term approach. I mean, I think for here in Minnesota, it's a little early to tell until we uh, see what the next few weeks are like because, you know, our peak has been pushed back a bit. I think we'll get a chance to watch uh, uh, what happens in uh, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, California, Washington State, and learn some things from approaches that they take. Um, I do think that it's very unlikely we that we all go back at once and that we all want our companies to go back at once. I think that looking at a staggered approach is probably going to be the most effective way to think about that, but there's a multitude of factors and directions that you could go with that. So I, I hate to give a vague answer, but I think it's, these are things to start talking about internally and, you know, looking, you know, let's look and see what businesses do on the two coasts that are going to be ahead of us in this fight. Um, do you, uh, this is from Carol. Do you foresee a problem with social distancing in the workplace? I think I'm you touched sure a little bit on it with with the call center piece, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think um, if I understand the question correctly, and feel free to to rephrase, and I'll, I can give it another shot. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there'll be. If we have to social distance going back into the workplace, yeah, I think it's going to cause some problems. I think one of the problems is just going to be the layout of, of our office space, the way that we all have probably thought about this over the years in terms of cubicles and offices or flex space or what have you. There's also the issue of just think about the, what the number of meetings in a corporate environment that you have to go to and you know sitting next to each other at a conference table. Now that needs to be you know, essentially every other seat, if not further away in order to do that. So what does that do to, you know, the size of our conference rooms and our ability to be effective in these meetings? And can we get the right number of people in the room? There's a huge number of challenges, I think, around all of that that will have to be figured out. Um, so great 
and uh, another great question coming in from Terry here, and you and I talked, I'm kind of chuckling because you and I just had this conversation. At, we have interesting conversations at the dinner table. Um, should employers be testing for temperature on for their on-site teams? What about the face cloth face mask covering, required or optional? Yeah, this is a uh, this is a great one, and I didn't include this, and I, I really should have. So um, l let's start with the face mask, with the cloth mask, right? Um, if that is still the CDC guidance when we get to return to the office, then we probably need to um, at least make that allowable, if that makes sense. I'm not. Some of our policies might prevent that. Um, by the way, just interesting bit of trivia. Minnesota state law prohibits wearing a mask in public. It actually is a crime to wear a mask in public, but we're wearing masks in public for public health guidance. So that just makes me kind of giggle internally. But okay, so one is like, um, if that's still the requirement, if that's still the public health recommendation, then you probably need to make sure that at least employees understand that's okay to wear a mask. I think part of your return to, to the office planning should be um, are we going to purchase masks for folks to wear? And here, I mean, cloth masks or something comparable. Do not do not buy N95 masks and things like that. They're going to take away from healthcare workers getting those. That will be a bad look for your company. Um, but should you provide those? And, and should you require those? I think are good. I don't know if there's a right answer to that yet, um, but I think that's a question you should consider. Temperature screening. Um, it's entirely possible that government might require temperature screening to return to the office. We have a client right now in New Jersey that runs a food production site in Newark, and they have about 600 people per shift that are, it's a wholesale food environment, right? So they're processing food, and then that food's getting uh, boxed up and then shipped to retail stores and others. Um, they, the, this, the city health department came in and said they had to temperature screen 600 people per shift, the whole shift. So essentially they, right now, are you, the security team is using handheld temperature screens, you know, the ones you kind of point at the forehead. But in a couple of weeks, they're switching to FDA approved uh, forward looking infrared cameras. You may have seen these on TV, like at a Chinese airport or whatever, looking that look at, a, you know, everything in the camera view and then alerts when someone is above the temperature that's been set. Um, and there's a, I don't remember what it is, there's a specific CDC temperature setting recommendation for coronavirus. So it might be, that might be required if, uh, if that's the public health guidance in order to go back to the office, um, or that might be something that you want to establish. Um, I think those are just questions that you need to think through internally. Excellent. Thank you. Um, what advice would you have for the legislators? Our politicians <laughs> <laughs> um okay so that's a complicated that's a complicated one um so and, and i'll keep this just i'll keep this very nonpartisan. i think the i think the governors as a whole across the country have been doing a pretty good job of communicating with the public uh what's going on and albeit very painful making decisions that are in the public health interests right now um, I think one of the most difficult things in the world for an elected official is to have to lead through a crisis like this, um, where you have the professionals, uh, the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health, for example, and her epidemiology team telling the governor, like, here's our best, best, here's the best data we have, here's the best public health guidance we have, but in the end, it's the elected official's decision, even though they're not the expert, on uh, what we're going to do. Um, I do think that Minnesota's done well in terms of the legislature being folk in, in um, most of you probably have read in the news, we have the only divided legislature in the country where we have one party controlling the house, that's the DFL, the Democrats, and one party controlling the Senate, the GOP or the Republicans, and they don't agree on a lot. <laughs> but I think they've done a pretty good job of working together through coronavirus to make sure as best they can um, that we're funding the right things, that we're um, buying equipment, uh, personal protective equipment and ventilators, 
that were making coronavirus a workers' comp eligible claim for first responders and healthcare workers. Um, I think those are all good things that um, where they've worked well together on these things. Um, I think my advice to um, the executive branch is just continue to, you know, I would listen to the experts and I would make the best possible um, public policy decision based upon what the experts are saying. Um, the, my only level of skepticism in Minnesota right now is twofold. Um, the governor hasn't released his data model and I'm not a modeler. I'm not an epidemiologist. I just want to see the data so that I can feel reassured that we're making the right decisions. Um, uh, and then second, um, you know, the, Governor Walls has stated repeatedly that we're smarter and better than other states and therefore we won't have as much impact. And I'm skeptical and a realist, so I, I, I don't think we're any better or different than other states. Um, and that's no slam on our on Mayo or our other you know healthcare uh, and biotech companies in the state, but our experience with coronavirus is going to be just as bad as every other state is going to be. We've just managed to delay this impact significantly right now. But that's me being a realist. So, um, for what it's worth, the uh, the Harvard uh, folks that we mentioned earlier, they actually met with the legislature virtually yesterday. I wasn't part of that conversation, but I helped set it up. And they, I, I think f from the recap I've heard from both the legislators that were there and the faculty that attended, it was a really good conversation about leading collaboratively through a crisis and understanding where you're at and thinking about your differences, but focusing on what you agree upon, which is a lot. They have a good agreement on a lot of things, so. Great. All right, um, kind of shifting gears a little bit, Jeff has a question kind of from a, our industry as a business continuity crisis management professionals. What kind of strategies do you think are gonna be bubbling up for future planning efforts that you know that you think we, that we're gonna, our leaders are probably gonna expect us to do? Cause I'm thinking, I remember back at night, at nine one, each one n one. You know, we we spent all this time and then you know talking about it, and then we really cared about it for like two years after that, and then it kind of fell off the radar. Yeah, so, I mean, what do you kind of think is going to happen? Yeah, and I I've reflected on my H one n one experience and went back and found my notebooks from the time uh, where I had taken notes from meetings and stuff and things that we thought were important and how those were important to me for about two years and then I moved on to other priorities. So, I mean, the, the obvious one is that pandemic planning will certainly be of importance again. Um, but I think that like most, like we saw with H1N1, I think that as a topic itself, I think will probably fade over time, right, wrong, or indifferent, right? And there'll be other things that happen and we'll shift to kind of thinking about those, about those things. Um, but I think there's some things from this as crisis leaders as continuity leaders that we should drive coming out of this. Uh, one is I think just planning assumptions around our worst case scenario or the, or the scenario assumptions or planning assumptions that we're putting into our business continuity plans. I think for most of us, and we heard this pretty consistently in our interviews, uh, for most of us, what we, what we heard uh, in these interviews is that companies started with their worst case scenario and things got worse over the next seven to 10 days. So I think um, thinking about what we considered our worst case scenario, we probably need to really reevaluate that um, where you, we need to think about a disruption on a global scale and what that means for, you know, geographical distribution of risk and some of the things that I think we maybe took for granted that this situation just demolished um, because it truly was a global issue. So I think it changes our planning assumptions. Um, I, I mean, I think certainly um, personal protective equipment and other supplies, um, maybe your company had a stockpile of this stuff. Maybe you had one after H1N1 and then you let it go away over time. Um, I think that'll be a whole new question again, um, not just for companies, but this is clearly gonna be a question at a state and federal level. Like even if we had more in the strategic national stockpile for this kind of medical equipment and PPE, we didn't have anywhere near what we needed. But again, that goes back to your planning assumptions. Did we have enough for the capabilities that we thought we were going to need? So those are some of the things uh, I, I think we're thinking about. Um, again, I think um, 
it, part of this will be what your executives want to drive. What they have taken away from this is important, but I think you have a huge opportunity to influence that over the coming weeks and months. And certainly when you get into your more formal lessons learned after action process, you can steer some of this towards what you think is really important and, and what what are those kind of lessons learned themes that come out of those discussions. It's part of why I encourage you to start some of that now, get a take on this 30, 45 days in uh, and how you want to move forward with that. Excellent. Um, all right, we've got some more questions here. They're just kind of pouring in. So uh, Blake Bennett would like to say hello first, and then he would like to know if you could talk a little bit about how you or the companies you're working with are integrating with the federal response. Kind of different than like a hurricane or flooding. So federal response and companies, how are you integrating with them? So on a couple levels, um, I mean, I think the for most companies, the point of integration um, at a federal level is through FEMA's uh, National Business Emergency Operations Center, which is part of the uh, private sector office. Um, this is uh, open to any organization of any size. Um, I think it's at fema.gov slash NBEOC, uh, N is in national, BEOC. Um, so they have calls uh, a number of times a week. Um, those are usually briefings that involve the DHS's Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, FEMA, HHS's Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, um, which is often just pronounced as ASPR, ASPR. Um, certainly that's a good kind of, of download of information. They also have a live dashboard with a chat room where you can get information and ask questions and interact with other companies as well. Um, so that's kind of a, that's a good point of integration. Companies that are in the healthcare sector, there's additional uh, points of contact with health and human services and with healthcare ready. Um, and then the ASPR's partnership program is called Tracy. So if you Google ASPR Tracy, that's T-R-A-C-I-E, there's some other newsletters and updates and points of communication. Uh, points of contact, I should say there. Um, so those are kind of the principal uh, points. There's um, the White House has also been holding a number of calls, um, primarily aimed at uh, they do a weekly state and local call um, that, uh, and they do a weekly emergency management call. Um, so you can usually get on those through your trade associations, like the International Association for Emergency Managers uh, in the U.S. Chamber. Um, I mean, they're definitely not, those are really not intended for collaboration as much as you're getting some high level folks from the uh, cabinet and from the president's staff that are briefing. And honestly, it's not anything you're not getting from the news, but it is kind of interesting uh, to connect to and, and hear that information. Those are probably the principal ways of integration. Um, there's also, um, you know, your, your local and county emergency management and state emergency management here are doing some different levels of collaboration. The state was supposed to run some calls for response. I haven't seen any of those, but maybe I wasn't on their list. So hopefully that helps. Yep, I, uh, so switching gears to um, my current favorite topic, education. Uh, Terry's curious about your thoughts about the impact to education going forward, um, similar to the business changes and physical setup. Um, and then just kind of a follow-up question around higher education. So I think it's kind of a two-phase question. We have our young kids that are at distance learning. It's not homeschooling, right? It's distance learning. I mean, what kind of impacts do you see, changes might you see there? And then from a college campus standpoint, what kind of changes do you envision might be happening there? Um, I'll say the, the K through 12 question, I think, is more complicated. I think... Um, I think it's unlikely you're going to see any kind of immediate change as in like this fall uh, from K through 12. But I think that this, for public schools anyway, I think this starts a conversation around how do we do this in the future when we have disruptions? What, you know, what does snow days look like in the future? What do, you know, what's a future, you know, stay at home situation look like for schools? But I think it also raises the other, it also raises the question of, what about alternate methods of delivery for K through 12 education to begin with? 
Um, but I'm skeptical that that goes very far in public schools because I just don't think there's going to be an appetite um, amongst the stakeholders for that kind of wholesale change. Private schools might be different because they can innovate in different directions and they're not tied to um, the, necessarily the same bureaucracy, regulation, or unions uh, that the public schools are. So I think that'll be interesting to see the difference uh, of what goes on um, moving forward. So colleges, I think, are a different story. I think colleges do have more freedom to do this and colleges are all headed down a path where they're pursuing more online education. I mean, I've seen this, uh, I'm an alumni of the Carlson School with, uh, for an MBA, and I was on their advisory board for four years. The first year I was on the advisory board in 2016, uh, we brought up online education and the, the staff and the deans were like, there's absolutely no way that we're going to shift to any kind of online education model. Now it's 2020, and even before the coronavirus became an issue, they're launching pretty much all of their degrees are now going, there's going to be a virtual option for education. So the market itself drove them to that issue uh, over the last five, six years. Um, so I think the colleges are already building out the kind of infrastructure and capabilities and faculty with this more online teaching skill set. Um, that might make it easier for them to offer these kind of things in the future. So I think colleges, I think you're going to see more bend in that direction. But K through 12 public schools, I, I'm not at all, I'm not sure that that's going to go very far. Yeah, and uh, Terry also kind of brought up the question from a higher ed standpoint on on campus housing. I think that I think she's got a point that that might be where the colleges have to kind of do some thinking before if they're to reopen in the fall. Yeah, I mean, um, yes. And it's certainly, I mean, the, the University of Minnesota, for example, has been on a housing crunch uh, because of the number of students that have come into the system, the Twin Cities campus anyway. Um, and now, you know, of course, all those dorms are closed. Um, at least I think they're all closed. Even for out-of-state students, I think they had to go home. Um, that's been an interesting... And there's some also some fee uh, reimbursement, housing reimbursement that's been a big issue for University of Minnesota students that were living on campus too, that I think just got resolved this weekend. Yep. <clears throat> Switching back to kind of continuity strategies, continuity planning, uh, Lauren has a question. Um, if you have any thoughts, if you're gonna see, if we're gonna see the end of alternate office space in continuity planning, um, this crisis has shown that companies can work pretty effectively from home and don't need a ghost office. So kind of the alternate workspace, the sun, well, the sun guards of the day and the other alternate workspace. Do you think that, that those are still going to be a thing going forward? Or I, I think that's a great the observation. The rents of trucks. <laughs> I think it's a, great, it's a great observation and one that I didn't address, but I agree. I think... I think for a lot of companies, this might be the death knell for that kind of off, alternate office space, with the only exception being, uh, there's certainly some of you on the phone that are in regulated industries, utility, uh, financial serv services, excuse me, are the ones that come to mind, healthcare would be another, where um, you still need that dedicated space or dedicated temporary space, like which might lead you to a rinsis or a sun guard kind of capability. Um, but I think we, I think, I think we've been seeing this for a number of years. I know my um, tail end of my days at Target, and um, I think Jamie Anderson and Anna Olson have presented this publicly enough times. We can, t I can talk about it. But you know, there was a, Target had a flood in the city center building, in the multi food tower, that took out about six or seven hundred uh, employees workspaces for about eight weeks. And following the business continuity plans we had at the time, we set up alternate workspace for them and only one person showed up. They all worked from home. So, I mean, I, I think yeah, even, yeah. four or five years ago, we were, or longer now, we were seeing some of that start to go. Right. And I think um, what I've heard from some companies is they're using some of their alternate workspace to help with some of that social distancing for the people that have to be in the right. office, you know, yeah. or you need X number of people, but you can have them some people in, you know, Brooklyn Park, some people in downtown Minneapolis or vice versa. I mean, so there is, you're right. And that's kind of more from the regulated industry standpoint, but mm -hmm. I agree. I think uh, we've been seeing the end of that here 
over the last five years. Okay, okay. one final question. We have four minutes. Um, in light of less than wide scale testing for COVID-19 around the state, how will it be possible to have a return to work movement when we really do not know who is infected? Well, I think this is where I'm I'm hopeful at least that there is antibody testing available um, in the near term that would help with some of that if that is indeed going to be a requirement um, to return to work. Um, I mean, I, I think we're all optimistic that May 4th, this stay at home situation uh, is going to end, but, you know, maybe it doesn't and we have to continue to stay at home and not go back to the office for a while. I think it's hard to tell yet. Uh, what that's going to look like. The, I do think this this is going to be a this will be a good couple of questions around testing and return to work and um, herd immunity and things to ask Dr. Osterholm next month. Not to punt the question, but he's better equipped on that. One. No, no, I, I was just thinking that same thing. Actually, um, it's not that you. I mean, we can sit here and speculate, but it, yes, I think Dr. Osterholm next month will have some good answers. Um, thank you so much, Brian, for your time. Um, excellent questions, everybody. Uh, look for some more information about our May meeting coming up here in a week or two. And um, have a great weekend and stay safe. Thanks, everyone.